John, can you give us an overview of the rise of the robo taxi industry in China? Uh, sure. So I guess in terms of globally, we have two massive robo taxi countries competing. It'd be China and the U.S. And in the past, I guess five or so years, China has really ramped up its scale of robo taxis in terms of. On one side, different companies operating it, increased collaboration with these companies and EV companies as well, and on the government side as well, funding into these pilot zones as part of their next generation AI made in China plans, and also on the private side as well, assisted autonomous driving.、Um, they have successive five-year plans for, to develop these, and I think this is part of why China is leading at the moment in terms of number of companies and technology development. My impression watching the Americans、uh, handle this is that it was driven by the private sector,、uh, and the government has been, you know, kind of dragged along by the development of the technology and the rise of the of the companies. But in China, it seems like it was much more strategic. Is that a fair thing to say?、Um, yeah, I think I'd say that's a fair thing to say overall. For example. In a lot of the tier one cities in China, the government has helped to introduce these demonstration zones where there's high levels of infrastructure in terms of 5G and vehicle connectivity, and where these companies can operate and test their vehicles. Whereas in the US, I mean, first of all, it's a lot more concentrated. For, like, I mean, a lot of these will be the tests will be in Silicon Valley, but like you say, they've sort of been dragged along. And without robo taxi in itself, is an interesting business because. As far as I'm aware, there's not really a company that's making a profit on them right now. So you're going to, I think that's where maybe the US has struggled a bit. Is just that they haven't, they've had to try to push it all privately without any sort of, I guess, overarching regulatory framework from the US overall. Right,、um, but my understanding is that、uh, in China,、uh, it's not just the national government, which I、uh, understand put、yes. uh, autonomous driving in. The five-year plans, which is very important, sets out the broad strategic approach of the national government,、uh, but also、uh, state or province、uh, governments and local governments played a big role in the development of this industry.、Uh, yes, absolutely, and that's why I think in a lot of the major cities, so looking at Beijing, Wuhan, Shenzhen in China,、uh, the local governments have a major part to play in that as well, in terms of developing first of all the infrastructure and the testing availability. Like the available zones to test in,、uh, which can be hundreds of square kilometers. In the grand scheme of things, that doesn't sound like a lot, but in terms of scaling up, that's a really major part of it. And also subsidizing things such as research and commercialization efforts as well.、Um, so that's a big part of why these local that you have these concentrated cities in China where most of this development is happening. I first got introduced to、uh, robo taxis in 2017 when I did a. I interviewed Tony Seba、uh, about his、uh, mobility as a service study, which was quite groundbreaking at the time. And and over the years, we've done you know the odd interview about this、uh, this topic. And one of the issues in the U.S. was liability. You know,、yes. if a if a robo taxi、um, uh, has an accident and someone is injured or killed. Who's liable? Is it the the、uh, the company? You know, like the ride hailing company? Is it the EV manufacturer? Is it the software manufacturer? And the feeling at that time was that it would take court cases、uh, and legal precedents to sort all that out. So it would take some time. But China seems to have taken the approach that uh, uh, you know local governments, provincial governments, national government set out regulations to clarify these kinds of issues. Which would make it easier to scale up, first of all, to develop the the technology, and then to scale it up. Is, is that a fair observation?、Um, yeah, I'd say so. I think generally what we have in the West uh, is um, we don't necessarily have a massive, like a massively great view of how China deals with certain accidents. Robo taxis will have accidents, and if you if you scroll through like the sort of Chinese social media, you actually see a lot of these accidents happening.、Um, but it's definitely the case that in the U.S., for example, that these court cases have been a pro- they've been challenging. First of all, to unpack who's at fault, and a lot of these traffic laws as well have been placed. They were obviously created with humans in mind, 
Um, so I don't know if I can add too much to that overall, but definitely it's been a complex thing in the US, not only in robo taxis, but in private vehicles. If you've seen the court cases with Tesla recently as well, and this has definitely appeared to be less of an issue for Chinese um, companies. Now, uh, one of the issues as we've been discussing this in the West a lot is and uh, industrial policy, uh, state incentives, uh, regulations, and so on, designed to help the industry. And that's been a, a big part of the rise of, a, of the industry in, in China. Could you do, uh, address that, please? Yeah, I mean, I guess, like, speaking also from an electric vehicles background as well, um, this is like a major part of why, again, China is leading, where not only on the consumer side, you have a lot of purchase subsidies and tax uh, tax credits, et cetera, which I guess we're seeing a lot, a lot less of in the US, for example, but also that there's a lot of subsidies in terms of research and development to aid that happening. And overall, it's just a faster moving environment in China where these things, yeah, they pass through a lot faster and you get a lot more support as a company developing it. So... Um, definitely in the case of the US, we can see, for example, the actual major robot taxi players, I guess you would consider Waymo, possibly Tesla, possibly Zooks, but definitely Waymo. Uh, previously, Cruise as well, and they're all based, they're backed by hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, otherwise they'd have no chance of survival. Whereas it's a lot more friendly in China, and the smaller companies, even like software-only companies, have been able to collaborate with the government and bigger players in EV, in battery, uh, to develop, yeah, the technology and actually have like deployments. Uh, I'm not sure if you can speak to this, but I'll ask the question. You can tell me. Um, my understanding is the national government has a large strategic plan on uh, where it tends to go, you know, geopolitically, and advanced technology manufacturing is a big part of that. Uh, you know, moving it out into exporting the technology, uh, having uh, Chinese companies set up operations in other, in other countries, that sort of thing. Is the robo-taxi uh, industry uh, part of that advanced technology strategy? Um, so I can't speak 100% on the topic, but if I had to, I mean, if you, if you had to take an educated guess, that's certainly the case. And you can see, for example, the big players like WeRide or Apollo, Baidu Apollo, uh, have made active, um, have made the active choice to partner with Western companies as well and expand into places like the Middle East, where I know in Dubai, I think they're making it, they're basically fast tracking this stuff so that you can just to get deployments off really quickly. And also they're now competing to enter competitive markets like Europe, which is somewhere where we haven't really seen any sort of actual developments yet so far. Um, so the expansion is definitely there. Uh, and you, can, you only have to look at the market activity to, I think, to, to clarify that. Another example is, I don't know if you've seen like the Tensor. It's a very, very futuristic looking private, supposed privately driven autonomous vehicle. And I think it's backed by Auto X, which was actually based out of China as well at some point. So, yeah, it's definitely, judging from that, I can definitely say that it's definitely part of their strategy, but I can't speak further on the specifics of that. If you were going to look out over the next five years, um, you know, to the growth of the robo taxi industry in China, what does it look like? Uh, are we going to see rapid growth? Are we now in the, the rapid scale up? part of commercialization? Yeah, and I don't think I'd be the only person to say that, but I think looking at our own forecast, we're looking at over 700,000 new robo taxis in China by 2030. Um, it's definitely the case where the government, especially in the case of these demonstrations and pilots, the government has help, helped prove, fund and validate them. And so scaling up is now a case of I guess, expanding that infrastructure that they have something to build off. So China definitely is going to be, in terms of addressable market as well, just the number of major cities and population by going to be the, the highest growing region uh, for robo taxis in general. And in the past few years as well, the developments in sort of hardware and software and vehicle connectivity have, I feel like, I don't know about you, but they've grown way faster than I could have imagined. 
And at this point, yeah, I think uh, scaling up is going to be a challenge still, and there's still regulatory challenges over it. Also, just in terms of operating areas, where you can get your high definition maps, for example, uh, and whether the local governments will, are happy to sort of have this data be shared as well, uh, are other considerations. But the growth, there's definitely potential for growth, uh, a major potential for growth. And yeah. So, John, thank you very much for this. Thank you.